with our faith and walking with Christ. I want to open with a passage, <clears throat> Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the uh, beginning of a new day, the beginning of a new week. We thank you, Lord, as the sun rose over the mountains and shines upon us. Lord, we are reminded of your light and your life that is continual and poured out to us every day. Uh, we thank you that you're, we're, as we come and worship together as the body of Christ, we're able to uh, reset and, and, and uh, point our hearts and minds towards you. And uh, we just ask that as we come together and offer of ourselves in this moment of worship, uh, that uh, you receive our, our praise, our songs, our prayers, our, our thoughts unto you as, a, as an offering of which you are worthy to receive. And we just invite your spirit to come and minister to us today as we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, say hello to someone next to you, and we'll continue in worship in just a minute.
the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful. Jesus my Lord, He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great Shepherd, the Rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Please join me as we affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Shall we pray? Out of your beauty, you have created us. Out of your love, you have redeemed us from the curse of the law. In your presence, we worship. In your name we pray, for your name is wonderful. You are the chief shepherd. You are the all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing God. You are Jehovah Jireh. Oh, your name is excellent in all the earth. Because at the mention of your name, all every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow. But Jesus is Lord. So we enter with thanksgiving and we allow praise to rise out of our grateful hearts. For we are thankful for all the benefits you continue to bestow upon us. We are grateful that you look beyond our faults and restore our souls. We are, great, we are grateful that you, you give us a grace of love, of joy, of peace. So put peace in our hearts. Our mind races and obsesses. We are confounded by the complexities and difficulties of life.
So we come by your invitation to cast our burdens on you. Yes, indeed, we cast the burdens of financial difficulties. We cast burdens of relational complexities, marital affairs, not to mention business and job and career, uncertainties. Indeed, we cast all of our burdens, and we ask that you give us the grace to leave them there, to leave, you, leave them with you, because you know what we want and you know our will. And even though we might be confounded by not knowing how you will work these things out for our good, grant us a modicum of faith so that we may trust you with all of our hearts and turn to you to direct our path and not lean, lean on to our own understanding. Lead us into the way of peace and help us to master ourselves so that we, beca we can become servants of thee and servants of our fellow neighbor. We come in remembrance of all of our neighbors, those whose lives are caught up in the jaws of sickness and illness and disease, those who are anticipating surgery and dealing with the anxieties of it, those who are recovering from surgery. Let them know that they're not alone, nor are they on their own. For you promise to give your angels charge concerning, concerning us to carry them while you minister to them. So we pray that they will experience wholeness and healing and cure in the very core of their being. We are mindful of those who care for the sick, the technicians and the nurses and the providers, those who minister to them in several ways, administrators, those that sit by bedside, we wrap them in the stripes in Jesus' body where there's healing. We claim this healing for those on our prayer list, and these at the sound of my voice, and even as we touch and agree with those outside the prayer list, including our pets and animals, that they may continue to experience wholeness and healing. As even as we continue to heal the wounds of sorrow and grief, we continue to lift up those in the Ukraine who mourn the death of loved ones as well as those in other parts of the world, even locally, even amongst our community, as we lift up the Nolans, the Olsons, the Kesslers, the Walthers, the Hales. Oh, that you may send showers of peace and comfort. Let the void be filled with your love. And those whose lives have been impacted by tragedy, may you continue to grant them courage, strength, hope to endure the season in their lives. Oh, that you might quicken our zeal and deepen our affections and Strengthen our judgment. Preserve us from our fretfulness. That we may always remember 
the power and essence of your name as they operate in our lives. We my call on the Christ who teaches us to live and pray in this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Announcements. Hygiene kit supplies urgently needed. We're trying to help out those of our neighbors who have been impacted by the fire, the wildfires. And we're asking that you donate personal hygiene items. For those of you who participated in the personal hygiene item uh, project for UMCO, Sega Brown, those are the same items we need. Uh, or you may visit the Welcome Center and get a list of the items that are needed, or call the church office for details. New, new member class is on May 22nd at 1215 p.m. in room 20, right there. You'll learn more about the ministries here at St. Stephen's and um, how you can connect and deepen your relationship with us. Uh, you may email your reservation to info at ssumc.com or call the church office to do so. Cellar Grounds is our outreach ministry. Bob Katz will be our guest artist. They will take us on a ministry or musical exploration of jazz. So join us in person or come or join us online as live Facebook. We'll be live streaming. Thursday Lunch Club is this Thursday at 11.30. Enjoy food, fellowship, music, and more. To donate today, visit St. Stephen's ABQ.org slash given to donate online or to set up text to give. Visit the Welcome Center to make a credit or debit card donation or mail a check in to the church office. Again, thank you so much for your generous support that allows us to, to partner with local and global agencies to bring the love of Christ to bear on their circumstances. We're calling the ushers to come to pick up the offering. After they pick up the offering, they'll pass out these attendance booklets, just give you some heads up. Uh, the base form is for members only. If you need to update your record, that's what you use. But give us your name and the time that you worship with us. The blue form is for our guests. Give us all the information that you can give us because we want to stay in touch with you. That's the only way we can do that. But if it's, this is your first visit to St. Stephen's, thank you for coming. Come again, bring a friend. Check the box that says, this is my first visit to St. Stephen's. Check out the brochures that give you more information on the ministries here at St. Stephen's and also the small groups that you can connect with. The welcome flyer is the form that you use to share your joys and your praise report with us so that we can rejoice with you. That's also the form that you use to request prayers uh, because we want to pray with you. We believe that prayer makes a difference. So... And on your way out, you can deposit that form in the offering box as you exit the Welcome Center. Also pay attention to the uh, offering envelopes. May the ushers come now as we continue to worship.
seated. All right. Thank you, David, for leading us in, in worship this morning. <laughs> Appreciate you. Did super job. Appreciate it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And also, Suzanne. Thank you, guys. Yeah, John's out on uh, graduation ceremonies, uh, his daughter, and so uh, that's a lot of folks doing graduation ceremonies in different places, so. All right, so last week I was out in uh, Indianapolis at a conference, and I, uh, I've been in Indianapolis before, but I hadn't made it over to the Speedway, so I thought, i got to run over and see the Indy 500 Speedway. So on my way over there uh, to see that, I saw a Methodist church, and I thought, got to shoot a picture of this one. Here's the sign in front of the Speedway United Methodist Church. It's like, you know, fastest service is probably anywhere in town, you know? I thought that was cool. I did make it over to the museum, got to see the museum. Unfortunately, I was trying to, wanted to get the tour to go around the track. Uh, they had, I don't know if it was prep for the races coming up, but they didn't have access to it. But anyway, had a good time there. All right, so a little humor. I always start with some humor this morning. So apparently, Betty, who worked in the bakery, was known for often taking instructions very literally. Yeah. Happy birthday, Cappy, with a C. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> C's not even on there anywhere. It's like, well... <laughs> All right, no more free samples for company employees during breaks. Yeah, if you're going to put the label upside down. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are fans of the movie Frozen, I'm not really a fan, but I have three granddaughters, and I've watched the movie more than I care to have. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Uh, unfortunately, Olaf, one of the key characters, Olaf's with the snowman in this uh, movie. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like he's gone to the dark side, yeah. Star Wars. 
how does that happen? <laughs> it's like, it's like, whoops, wrong, wrong package there. Finally, my guess is that it's a non-smoker that decided where to put the designated smoking area. Right next to flammable material, yeah. Yeah, our, our non-smokers keep disappearing. We don't know what happens to them, you know. Okay, on to the message for today. So, uh, in, uh, throughout this series, I've always begin this, begun this message with this, with this key verse out of 1 John 4.18. So, let's look at this. Uh, let's say this together. Okay, here we go. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment the one who fears is not made perfect in love. So as I started out the series, I, I focused on this verse, uh, placing love as the foundation by which we stand on in order to face the fears. And this is something the Holy Spirit and God continually works to uh, drive out fear through the presence of His love. And in the first message I talked about, and the message is called Who, What, Why, When, Where, uh, I focused in on the beginning of who, reminding us, don't ever forget who you are. <laughs> you're, you're made in the likeness and image of God by the Father. He's called our Heavenly Father because we came from Him. And not only did God made us, but He loves us. That has got to be foundational. Otherwise, we're never going to have the strength and the discernment and ability to overcome fears. Uh, because, and I talked about, too, how the, at least a couple different directions that, that we overcome f- fears. One of them is by just simply casting them out. Uh, you, you look close enough at something, you realize, oh, I'm, I'm just magnifying this thing out of proportion. <laughs> this is ridiculous. This isn't really accurate. And we learn to cast them out. The other direction is, oh, this is a real problem. This is a real concern. This is a legitimate source of fear. I need to put a plan of action together to address it. But both of those have to have love as a foundation to start with. So what we're looking at today is a story out of the Old Testament that to me gives us a word picture on how do we develop and strengthen those areas in our life uh, to strengthen our faith to overcome the fears that we we face. Because we're always going to be facing fears throughout our life. It's just as long as you're alive, that's a reality. So, we have this story out of the Old Testament. Some of you are familiar with it. It it comes out of the character. uh, His name is Nehemiah. You may have heard him mentioned before if you've ever been through a capital campaign to build a building. (laughs) That's like the number one character and story to focus on because we're building these walls. And so, Nehemiah is a lead character whom God called to instruct and lead the Jews to build the walls surrounding Jerusalem. This is uh, just a little context here. The, this story go back, goes back to 587 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's king over the Babylonian Empire. He comes in, he conquers Jerusalem, levels the place. The, the, the temple and the walls are destroyed. King, king Solomon's temple. Then, uh, so he hauls off a bunch of Jews back to uh, Babylon, not all of them, there's a few left. The prophet Jeremiah ends up staying there and a few others. But majority of them are hauled off to Babylon. About 70 years later, God raises up Ezra. And Ezra, this is about 515 B.C., uh, King Cyrus releases him to, sends him to go back to Jerusalem, lead these Jews back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. So they rebuild the temple. Then about 70 years after that, we have Nehemiah. Nehemiah, God raises up Nehemiah, and he leads the Jewish people to rebuild the walls surrounding uh, Jer- Jerusalem. Now, understand that, that walls and gates back then, then are, is, this is their defense system. Like, you know, we have an army and the military and all equipment and everything. Back then, you, you had some soldiers, but if you didn't have walls... An army could just come in and just kind of raid the place, and you don't have any defenses. So walls were vital in protecting the people inside. In this case, it's vital in protecting uh, the temple that has just been built. It's interesting. Isaiah makes a spiritual reference here on walls and gates, and this is out of Isaiah 60, verse 18. You will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. You'll call your walls salvation and your gates praise. 
So Nehemiah, in, in some sense, is this parallel, this metaphor on how God builds faith in our life to overcome the challenges and the fears and, and the, uh, the, the things that we face. So Ezra is a parallel. The building of the temple is the parallel uh, to the Holy Spirit coming in and, and establishing in, in our life. Jesus said that he told his disciples, I'm going to have to leave, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to come in and be your counselor, be present with you. Paul said that uh, in 1 Corinthians six nineteen, he says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. It's different in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and rest upon them. In the New Testament, because of what Jesus Christ has done in us, he has forgiven us of our sins, cleansed us, and the Holy Spirit is then able to reside in our spirit and our soul. So we have the Holy Spirit's presence in us, but then there is this building of walls and gates to protect that which God has established in us. Well, how does that work? Well, I don't fully understand this part, and you'll see, and I'm going to tell you a couple of stories, but we see this manifested in the lives of those around us in, our, in ourselves. For example, when I was in high school, I had a classmate, name was Claude, Claude Choate. Claude was a, a, what we call a druggie, okay? We had a bunch of druggies. I had a class, graduating class of 600. We had, we had a, quite a few druggies, okay? These are drug addicts, okay? That was his reputation, okay? Everybody knew it. One day, Claude went to, I think it was a worship concert or something. Anyways, he, he gave his life to Christ. You know, goes down to the altar, prays, gives his heart to Jesus, and he's, he, he shares the testimony. He, he's on the altar, and he looks at his arms, and he sees this, this sweat just coming out of his arms, and he's going, what in the world? And, and he found out later, soon thereafter, God had supernaturally sweated the drugs out of his body. He had n no addiction, no problem, no withdrawals, no nothing. I mean, just miraculously healed. Uh, so that's a case where Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in, and it's like immediately walls and gates get r raised up, and in that area of his life, he, he's healed. You know, he, and, and that, those walls are established, and they're strong. And he stayed that way the rest of his life. I have a relative. <laughs> She struggled for alcoholism, alcoholism most all of her life, kind of going back to the teenage years. In her late 40s, she finally gave her heart to Christ. But for the next 10 to 12 years, just battled with alcoholism. You know, it was on the wagon, then off the wagon. <laughs> On the wagon, oh, we, you know, gets, goes through a program. Oh, we, th we think we we're here. We think we've arrived. This, off the wagon. On the wagon. And, and for those of you who have family members that, you, you know what that's like? It's hard. It's, it's hard for them. It's hard for, for family members. And, but finally, after about 10 or 12 years, uh, it came to a point where it was like, boom, I, no desire whatsoever. Okay, why did one happen instantly? And one happened 10 or 12 years later. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that part. I do know, though, that for most of us, we're kind of similar more to um, the, the, the latter where it takes time and it takes perseverance. <laughs> and slowly those walls go up to finally there is a breakthrough and, uh, and there's victory. So the, the, this picture of walls and gates we're going to see as we look at this story parallel what God did for the Jews and the Israelites parallel what's happening in our life. And that's where we can learn from this story. If, uh, if you want to look deeper into it, I encourage you to read, read chapters 4 and 6 of Nehemiah if you need some encouragement. Because it's the story of when they were battling through this and the physical battle they face there are the spiritual battles we face uh, today. And why, why these things uh, are important. So, now, some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, okay, that's a nice pastor. Um, yeah, I, I don't have an uh, addiction to drugs or alcohol. That's great. But what do you do when you deal with the pain and the harshness 
and the suffering and loneliness of life. What do you turn to? Are we turning to something that the Holy Spirit is saying, yes, this is good and helpful, or is it something that is destructive, and if we're not careful, it could undo us? You know, I've shared before, I've got a pastor friend of mine I've known for years, and he left a gate open in his life, and it was pornography, and he's not in pastoral, serving as a pastor anymore. So we've we got to be careful with what we let through the gates because the enemy, if we're not careful, will undo us. And the Holy Spirit will warn us if we're careful, pay attention, but uh, we've got to be careful in these areas. Uh, one area, this, I thought of this area, this is an area that all of us deal with uh, in different times of our life, uh, and that's the uh, spirit of anger. So here's one that says this, Proverbs 25, 28. If you cannot control your anger, you're as helpless as a city without walls. So there's that direct reference there. Open to attack. If you cannot control your anger, you're as helpless as a city without walls. Open to attack. Now, it's not that we don't get angry. It's not appropriate to get anger at, angry at certain things in our life. That's appropriate. But is it, is, it, is it under the leading and prompting of the Spirit, or is it just blown out of control? Is, is it damaging? Uh, so... This is an area that uh, it's an area that involves walls and gates. How we do it. So this whole thing about walls and gates is, is another way of saying boundaries. Okay, setting boundaries in our life, saying no to certain things that uh, we know are not uh, appropriate. Saying sometimes it involves people. You know, there there are some people we may just say, "No, I'm sorry, you can't come in." <laughs> You've been too destructive in the past. I'm setting the boundary. No. Okay? And so those are boundaries we have to set sometimes or adjust at times. Sometimes it's different spirits, and different attitudes. We have to decide, nope, sorry, not doing that. Or certain behaviors that we have to set these boundaries. Otherwise, they can be uh, destructive in attack. So this, as we look through it, we're just going to look at different, a couple different scriptures. The detail, how did Nehemiah handle the attacks that were coming uh, against him and, and the Jewish people as they were trying to build these walls to protect the temple and the, the people themselves. So here we're picking up in Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, verse 1. Now it came about that when San, Sanballat heard we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. So, I love it. It wasn't just furious. No, no, he was like, and very angry. It was a little redundant there, but he's trying to get to the point. Hey, he was like really, really mad. And he mocked us. This usually happens when you set up boundaries and you're going to offend somebody. Okay, that's, that's just a reality. And as, as long as you're, the, the point is listening to the Holy Spirit, being obedient to the Holy Spirit and the Word. Uh, it's, you're going to cause anger. Uh, so, he was very angry, and he mocked them, you know, okay, so it started to attack them. So it was kind of like San Ballot was probably thinking, all right, it's one thing that you rebuilt the temple. It's another thing that you're trying to protect it. And he got angry and uh, came against him. And, you know, one of the things about following the Lord and walking with the Lord, you're going to face these challenges, and we have to learn how to overcome discouragement. You have to learn how to overcome discouragement. So, this is what, uh, this is one process that uh, takes place uh, with Nehemiah. So, this next verse here. He spoke in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria and said, okay, all right, he's got this whole army coming against him, okay? So, this is a real fear. This isn't just imaginary. This is a real problem here. And this is what the army of Samaria said, leader, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps of rubble burned as they are? What do you think you're doing, you feeble Jews, you defeated people? You, what do you think you can rebuild this? Are you kidding me? Who do you think you are? Now, why are the Jews doing this? 
I think it's because it's in God's heart. This is something God put in their heart to do, to rebuild and restore the temple and also the, the walls surrounding. Why? Because the temple and the walls had a messianic purpose. When Jesus came, he came to the temple. <laughs> he spoke about the temple. And he used the temple as a reference point to himself, saying this is a, this is a temple, temple, it's going to be destroyed, but I've got a temple that's eternal. And so it was, it was vital that the temple did get rebuilt, rebuilt, and the walls as well. So they were following God's leading and God's prompting. <clears throat> And I love that last line. Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? What's that got to do with us? Anywhere in the Bible it talks about us being stones? Yeah, 1 Peter. He wrote and he says, we're living stones. We're living stones that God brings together to build his church in, in, in the body of Christ. We're living stones. Well, what's it mean if they're burned? Well, has anybody been burned in life? <laughs> Experience any painful failures in your life? Pain, yeah, that's, that feels, that's what it feels like to get burned, to get damaged. Uh, you know, and that's where the enemy comes in and he accuses us and says, you can't do that. You're, you're damaged good. You can't be rebuilt. You can't be restored. Who do you think you are? And voice of the Holy Spirit says, yeah, that's the voice of the enemy. You're going to have to learn to ignore those lies and listen to my voice and walk a path of restoration. So what does Nehemiah do in response to these accusations? He says this, <clears throat> verse 4, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Yeah, we just heard that. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder to the land of captivity. So with the, with the words that he heard, he just says, nah, God, you deal with that. You handle that. I, I offer that to you. I send it back to you. You handle that. But that's not all that he did. He had a plan of action in place as well. Okay? Uh, they, they were focused on the real fears that were surrounding them. So what did they do? The... It says the, the, the Jewish people divided into two different groups. Half of them put on shields and swords and spears, and they were prepared for battle. The other half picked up a shovel and a pickaxe and, and got to work and rebuilt the wall. So they had a plan of action to protect themselves while they were uh, building the wall. They acknowledged that they did face threats, and, and, and this was a real threat, and they had an action plan in place. Uh, Jesse referred last week to faith as fast acting in the hard times, <laughs> you know, and so they're, they're acting in response. So there's an action part of this along with casting the, the care uh, to the Lord. So the next thing Nehemiah does is he encourages them. Why does he encourage them? Because th these are real discouraging realities they're facing. They needed encouragement. So, yeah, whatever you got to do in your life to keep encouragement coming in, do that, okay? If it's... I do the best I can on Sunday mornings to try to present a good message, but if you're not listening to more preachers than I am, you're probably going to dry up pretty good. <laughs> you know, find some preachers and leaders and speakers that inspire you. Listen to them. <clears throat> I do the best I can, but it's, hey, it's 20, 25 minutes a week. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll go 30 today. No. <laughs> uh, no. Um, all right, so this is what Nehemiah says. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, I love that he calls them nobles, and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So he encourages them. He says, listen, don't be afraid. That's, that's like the recurring command in Scripture. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Okay? That's the number one call. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Okay, picture this scene here. He, he's, Nehemiah is standing up there. He's facing the people, and he's standing on these burned stones, these these rubble, and he, 
he, he says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. What does it take to declare God is great and awesome when, you, when you're standing on a rubble of burned stones? <laughs> it's like, you know, what does it take to declare God's goodness when everything in life is screaming the opposite of suffering and pain and, and loneliness and, and, and all that? Well, it takes faith to do that. Because when you find yourself doing that in the worst of circumstances and you declare, God, you're good, you're awesome, uh, you, you're, you're great, you realize that's not me. That, that's the Holy Spirit in us doing what only the Holy Spirit can do. And that's a witness of the Holy Spirit saying, when, when, when in the natural it makes no sense, you're just declaring by faith, God, you're good, and, and you're great, and you're awesome. And eventually those words will pr- produce fruit in kind. So that he's declaring goodness, and for the sake of, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> throw it back up there, yeah, yeah, for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes, for, 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 for all of us here. And so he's making that, remember why you're, you're doing this, it, it, it matters. And, you know, whether or not your physical family is, is here or nearby, if you're involved in the church, you have a spiritual family, and that spiritual family matters. I, I mentioned this before, I, I Growing up with my dad, my dad was a good dad. He was a good provider. Um, did a lot of fun stuff together. You know, I have a lot of great memories doing great stuff. Spiritually, yeah, not so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my dad was, was um, he got baptized and made a profession of faith, but beyond that, we never had any spiritual conversations. Now, I could talk to my mom and talk to my sister, older sister, yeah. Uh, but fortunately, we still all went to church, and I had a spiritual family, and I had mentors who I could talk with, who would talk with me and help me grow and understand about my walk with Christ. It matters. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference. So your, your faith and your faithfulness to the end is important. Don't ever think that doesn't uh, matter. It, it inspires and puts courage in the life of others. And, and I'm thankful that I do get to talk to you know, my, our kids about their faith, um, uh, a while back, Michael, my son, son called, and he started asking me questions on theology, and I'm going, he, he's a pilot, you know, but he's active in his church, and he's going through this process of becoming an elder, which is different than an elder in Methodist church. It's like a lay leader uh, within the church. And he's asking these questions. He's going, don't Methodists believe that? And I was like, yeah, I guess you really were listening. <laughs> you know? It's like, yeah, I was. I was paying attention. <laughs> and we had a great conversation. It's, it's a blessing to talk about these things. Um, all right, so the last thing I want to mention about this story is, is in chapter 3, I'm not going to read the passages, I'm just going to summarize what happened. If you read through pa- chapter 3, Nehemiah describes the different gates, and some of the titles of the gates are kind of funny, you can read it yourself, but the gates, with the gates, is also a description of the people who are working that gate and that wall and that area. And, and the families that are, that are involved. And one of the things that come out of that story, and most scholars uh, from a variety of theological perspectives do agree on this matter when it comes to the Jewish people, that there's a marked change in the life of the Israelites, the Jews. Whereas before, they leaned pretty much on just the leader. You know, you, you look at Moses and when he led the Israelites, and you heard me tell this story numerous times, he'd lead them into the, into, into, the, into the desert towards the promised land, and all they did was start to whine and complain. We, we, we don't, we're tired of this food. We're tired of this manna. Uh, we're tired of where we're it's, it's hot out of here. You know, it's, take us back to Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt. It was better for us slaves. And Moses is going, oh, God. Well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just the most amazing story of, of a, Moses' perseverance. Pretty much the survival of the Israelites was on Moses' back. It, it probably got a little better under King David, and, but, you know, I mean, still, it was heavy on the leadership. And here in this story, when they're all together, everybody contributing and building the wall on doing their portion, it, it's, it's one of the first times you see everybody's contribution mattered and made the difference. And they all helped each other at different times. Sometimes they would get, a part of the wall would come under attack from the enemies, and they'd all swarm over and help uh, overcome, and they'd work 
together. But it's this picture of every uh, person uh, using and serving to build what God was purposed in mind. And, and to me, that's one of the great pictures of the church. When, when Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit. And, and on the day of Pentecost, you have what was, you know, you had 12 disciples, and actually you had about 120 followers who were gathered, uh, disciples were gathered in that upper room. And all of a sudden, you know, the Holy Spirit shows up, and it goes from 120 to, boom, 3,000. And that it continued to expand beyond that. And the life of the church was primarily on the work of the Holy Spirit on every believer. And that was what the, the amazing reality of what was taking place then. And the, to me, that's a picture of what the church is called to be. Everybody uh, doing their part and, and serving and to bring life uh, to the church. And to me, I think... I was asked this week, a guy was saying, hey, we got in this conversation. You, you really think we're, like, we're in the end times? And I was like, yeah, but not like most people think. I, you know, people are thinking, oh, things are so bad, they're awful, and, and they're so dark. And yeah, we're, we're in crazy times. I mean, no question about that. But to me, the greatest witness of the nearness of Christ isn't the darkness of the times, not that it won't be dark, but it's a witness of the power of the Holy Spirit upon the earth like we have never seen uh, before in creation. And to me, that's what I look forward to, and uh, that's what I think God is wanting to do. God, we, we just give you thanks for this uh, picture in the Old Testament, trying to help us see what you're doing in our life. And, and so, Holy Spirit, I just ask that by the power and grace of your Spirit, that right now as we gather together in your presence, this place we come to, to receive the reality of your presence, that you would speak into our spirit something in our life, someone that we're allowing through the gates entering into our life that you're saying, no more, stop it, close that gate that is not helping you in your call to discipleship. Lord, Holy Spirit, you just identified that to us right now. And then we would make a commitment uh, this morning. Say, no, sorry, not going to open that gate anymore, whether it's a behavior or an attitude, whatever it is, Holy Spirit, you just identify that to us clearly right now. Also, Lord, there may be someone who, whom you have sent into our life um, or some opportunity, and, and you're saying, I want you to open that door, and, and I want you to allow me to work through that. And so uh, that, that you would just help give us clarity on the gates of our life, that we might step up closer in our walk, in our faith, in our courage with you. We thank you that you are ever faithful every day to walk with us. We're, we're not going to be fearful that we're going to miss this. We're, we're going to stand on the foundation of your love and believe that, that you're going to help us grow in this area. And we thank you for this picture and the leadership of Nehemiah uh, to help us understand how we're to walk with you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing song. Sail his ways from the fears that 
Uh, next week, we'll can finish up our series, Faith Over Fear. We'll be looking at a particular psalm that I think I found most helpful in strengthening uh, my faith. And also, the, the sermon title is, is uh, Pathways to Highways on how we um, God actually, uh, or, or by our faith, can, can actually change our brain, our physical brain, on how we uh, strengthen our faith. So we'll look, look at that next week. Uh, so, oh, one thing I do want to mention on our website, uh, if you, if you, somebody asks you a question, okay, wh- what is, uh, how, how is the not having general conference in 2022 uh, affecting the Methodist Church and affecting our local church in St. Stephen's? Uh, instead of doing a whole Sunday morning on that, uh, I, I put it in a video form. So if you go, uh, some of you, if you get our e-zine, you get a link to that. Uh, if you haven't and you missed that, I encourage you to go to our website and hit sermons or messages, and uh, you can go to our YouTube page, and it has on it, and it says Pastor's Update, and you can see it's a different uh, slide there. So I encourage you to check that out, uh, and that um, like changes related to General Conference 2022. All right, I think that's all I've got, so let me send you off with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen.